Welcome back to Eschatology Matters. I'm your host, Josh Howard, and I want to remind you Eschatology Matters is now part of the Fight, Laugh, Feast network. So you can find our content where it's always been, uh, but you can also find it on the uh, Pub TV app, uh, or at least I'm told that it'll be there soon if it's not already uh, there. Um, Today is our second installment in a uh, pretty application-based series that we've been doing. Uh, We've been calling this Practical Implications of Eschatology, and we're specifically looking at how to establish Christian communities, um, what, what that looks like and what that entails and how eschatology might help inform that discussion. So today I'm joined uh, by a very special guest, Dr. Joe Rigney, coming to us from uh, Moscow. So Dr. Joe, thank you so much for uh, for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So uh, Dr. Rigney, you're a fellow of theology uh, at New St. Andrews. Um, you just had a, a book come out, Leadership and Emotional Sabotage, um, it which is, I'm, I'm assuming it's available everywhere at this point. It right? is. On it's, Amazon. it's out in the world. Out in the world, fantastic. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to thank you again for the book. The book's been super encouraging. And you want to just give a little plug for the book, by the way, since we're... Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, it's basically, um, you know, the world's going crazy. The world's falling apart. Um, great unraveling. Um, lots of anxiety and angst in the air that kind of crackles through and affects institutions. Uh, and therefore, what kind of leaders do you need in order to address that kind of uh, civilizational um, unraveling? And uh, in it, I'm kind of pulling together uh, some stuff from Edwin Friedman, who was a big influence on me um, over the last decade or so. Um, but Friedman was, um, you know, a Jewish rabbi, secular thinker, um, evolutionist. And so there's a lot of when you he's got a lot of great stuff, but you have to kind of wade through a lot of junk. And so I've been using it, but kind of translating it for a while. And this book is kind of the fruit of that, of taking, you know, some of his observations, but trying to ground them and root them a little bit more in biblical soil and say, hey, the Bible actually addresses this and has particular categories. Um, and so to think about what does leadership look like? What, what's the key kind of key virtue is sober mindedness. Um, how does that, what, if you try to be that, what's going to happen? You're going to get sabotaged and, and people are going to attempt to steer you and, and take you out. Um, and then what does it look like practically in the home, the church, and the world? So that's kind of the, it's, it's a short book, um, but hopefully it kind of packs a little bit of a punch and is the sort of book that you need for 2024. Perfect. Yeah, no, it's, I've, I've shared it around with our leadership here at the church and, you know, with some friends, it, it it's always striking whenever you've got a book like that one where uh, you're describing these scenarios and it's like, oh, I've, I've literally been through that within the last six months. Like I, I yeah. know exactly right. what he's talking about. So right. yeah, you're, you're over the target with it. Um, But let's talk, let's talk Christian communities a little bit while yeah. Got- do it. Um, first of all, in your thinking, you know, we're not looking for technical definitions per se, although if you've got one, it's most welcome. But um, just thinking through with trying to Christian culture build, Christian community build, um, there's been a lot of pushes lately toward kind of localism or associationalism. I, I, th- I feel like, uh, you know, my limited perspective of especially evangelicalism, there used to be like this whole um, you know, especially looking at the nation, looking at wide things. And now there's there maybe a little more of a cultural sense of like, who can I connect to locally? What what does it look like to establish things in my home and in my church and in my community? Uh, maybe more so than there were in generations past. Uh, but with all that said, like what 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 constitutes a Christian community in your thinking when we talk about trying to build Christian communities? Um, are there are there like certain standard features? Obviously, it's going to probably look different in Moscow yeah. um, than it's going to look here in Battle Creek, Michigan, those sort of things. But like what in general yeah. can we think about when we, when we think about Christian community? Yeah. So, well, I mean, as as Providence would have it, like I've been teaching, I taught on uh, political philosophy for our Lordship students the last couple of days, uh, freshmen. So our freshmen have a theology course that they take. It's like our foundational theology at New St. Andrews. And I teach one, I teach a couple of cohorts of that or, or sections of that. And Jared Longshore teaches the others. And uh, so today, today and yesterday was basically kind of Christian political philosophy. And in the course of that, kind of laying out, you know, that that um, that in classic Protestant political thought, politics is the art of uh, associating men uh, together for shared life. So poli- more, most broadly politics isn't, you know, we think we say politics today and we think like elections and, um, Washington DC and things like that. But in the, in the broader tradition, like the, the historic Christian view, and this goes back to pagan to Aristotle does it. Politics is like, anytime you're trying to bring people together for some purpose. So, so symbiosis is the key word from, uh, a guy named Althusius wrote a book called Politica, which is like a Christianized 
polit Aristotle's politics. And anyway, so it's like associating men together for to conserve and preser preserve and uh, cultivate social life among them. So shared life is what politics is about, which means your household is political. Uh, your business, you know, you're at your uh, economic market. You're, if you're a guild, you know, in the old days, it would have been a guild or something like that. Today, it's a business. Um, so that's that's political. Church is political. Um, uh, the visible church is a political entity. Um, and the state, the city, um, your your nation, your empire, whatever, all of the different levels of uh, civic society are all political. But everything's political. And um, some of the key distinctions that they use is basically like, well, you have the inner man. So that's like your soul. And then you got the outer man, your, your, um, your body and your conduct, your, your public conduct. And while, um, you know, God has to do with your soul directly, everybody stands before God directly, um, in the external world, like we have all sorts of relationships of, of order and structure and hierarchy that we have to deal with. So like in a home, you got a you got father and mother, that's kind of the heads of that, of a home. The father's the head of the home and, and you've got authorities there who mediate God's rule to you in the household. And then you've got the institution of the church where you have pastors that mediate God's rule in the visible church. And in the state, you've got magistrates who mediate um, God's rule in society. So in the, in the, in the, um, in the external world, the external forum, um, well, that's what Calvin called it, the external forum, you've got mediators uh, in these different kind of core institutions. So the family, the church, and the state. And and they're charged with they have they're given kind of they're delegated authority to kind of make rules and enforce rules for the good order of each of those institutions. And so when you think about Christian community or you think about what that means, that's kind of the like that's where you start. Is there you have these bodies of these groups of people, different members of a of a body that has a head, or in some cases it could be plural heads. You have uh, multiple you know elders in a church or something. Right. Um, and the right ordering of the body is the responsibility of the heads who seek to order the structure of the body for its purpose um, and in obedience to God for the purposes that God set for it. So the family has a particular purpose, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. The church has a particular pur purpose, preach the word, administer the sacraments. The state has a particular purpose, maintain order and justice in society. And each of those different institutions has a purpose. And the task of the head is to regulate and order those those entities for, for their purpose in obedience, in obedience to God. So that's kind of like a rough and ready kind of how does. And then and then I think one of the things sometimes that we can do, people will talk, hear that and go, oh, you're talking about sphere sovereignty. You know, like that's how, you know, uh, Abraham Kuyper and those guys talked about sphere sovereignty. And I'm a little bit um, sphere sovereignty makes me a little nervous because it can kind of make it sound like the spheres are autonomous, like they exist under themselves. When the reality is, is they overlap a lot, right? Like that your your family is affected by your church and by the state, and the state is affected by the family and by the church, and the church is affected by the state and the family. So they kind of overlap, and it's not as though so, so there are particular responsibilities that are proper to each one. So you know, dad doesn't have the sword; he can't execute anybody. That's not his. That's not his. Uh, he doesn't have that authority. Neither can the church. The church can excommunicate, but the church doesn't execute. And so there's different, there are different like tools, you know, this, the, the family has the rod um, as sort of its representative disciplinary tool. Um, the, the church has the keys, excommunication, that's its representative disciplinary tool, and the state has the sword. So all of that's true, but there's a, but in terms of the, the, um, the law, the law, uh, the fundamental law that overarches all, it's all God's law, right? Mm -hmm. So the the home so if if we take sort of the ten commandments as as the as Protestants have historically done as a shorthand summary of the universal moral law applied to Israel but like these are these are universal moral there's an abiding significance to this to these laws um, in, in the moral dimension um, the family should should encourage obedience to all ten of those in the family and the church should encourage obedience to all of those in the church and the state should encourage obedience to all of those in its capacity, using the tools that God has given to it. So everybody's got the same, you know, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you sort of thing that Jesus does, says in, in, in terms of discipleship. Every institution ought to obey God in all of those areas. And different they have different means that they've been given in order to accomplish that, in order to direct people to um, to obedience to Christ, obedience to God. Okay. Okay. No, that's, that's super helpful. I appreciate what you said about Kuiper too. That's, that seems like that's a, that's a frequent conversation these days is a, uh, but we won't go yes. down that correct, but think, thinking toward the Christian yeah. okay. thing. Okay. So you're like, well, let's just say you're, um, you're wanting to build Christian community, Christian culture. Yep. Um, you're wanting to have that, that sort of impact where you are. Um, 
And especially I'm thinking toward like maybe somebody that might be watching this channel. They don't have, you know, they don't hold political office and they don't serve as an officer within the church or anything like that. But um, like, what are some of those kind of ground level practical steps? Because you just mentioned some universals, right? These are like some of those principles you're talking about are universal. They they cross over these different Mm -hmm. um, spheres or, you know, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but like, what what is something that like just the the normal pew sitting rank and file Christian and they're looking around, they're saying, okay, I want, I, I know this conception, I probably need to start being a good dad in my home or whatever that looks like. But like, what are those like basic steps toward building Christian culture where you are or Christian community? I'm sorry, where you are. Yeah, that's that's good. So I think uh, one thing. So start with this: like, uh, worship is at the heart of every community. That'd be a fundamental principle. Okay, um, it's one that we we hold to pretty strongly here in Moscow. Um, you know, ancient cities, medieval towns had a cathedral in the town square. Ancient cities had temples at the heart of the city. Um, the New Jerusalem has a temple. You know, well, New Jerusalem doesn't have a temple because the whole thing is a temple. But um, the temple was at the center of Jerusalem. And so worship, um, corporate covenantal worship is at the heart of all communities. And that's true of both believing communities, Christian communities, and unbelieving communities, right? They're going to, you're going to put something at the center. Worship is going to be the heartbeat. And if you think, and I, and I, that, that image of heartbeat is helpful because then worship then pumps blood to the rest of the body. It pumps blood into all of the other things. It pumps blood into the family. It pumps blood into the market. It pumps blood into the state. It pumps blood into the arts, entertainment, and society. So that worship is going to, it's going to come out in all of these other areas. So if I'm talking to someone who's going, okay, where do I need to start? It's like, well, you need to start with worship of God, worship of the living God in Christ. That needs to be like, that's the heartbeat. Um, that's, that's the regulatory rhythm in terms of your life. So Sunday morning, worshiping with God's people is fundamental, but then it's going to work its way out and it's going to pump blood. And the first place it's going to land is in, in your home. So now you're, you're a dad. And, and if you're, if you're, if I'm talking to a dad, uh, who's the head of his home and he's the head, whether he wants to be or not, that's not a, it's not a, um, Right. open job description for which, you know, it's a, it's an indicative, not an imperative. You are the head. Just are you going to be faithful or not? Recognize that as the head, you're, you're charged with culture uh, making, culture creating. So in your home, you're the cultural guardian um, and your wife is your helper in this. And she's actually going to be really, you know, bring a lot to the table in terms of cultivating culture. And culture is going to have two elements. It's going to have a formal element. That's what we call law. So you're going to have house rules. And it's going to have more informal. And this is like the habits of the home. And so there's certain things that are like laws that you're going to say like, um, okay, there's three there's three rules. Always obey mom and dad all the way right away with a happy heart. Uh, don't, don't lie. And um, don't sass your mother. Those are the ones you have to remember those. You never, never forget them. If you, if you forget them, you're culpable and you'll get a spanking. That's that's law. But then there's other things that are um, that are uh, more of the informal practices and habits that you're going to have in your home. What is what do morning routines look like? What do weekly routines look like? And those are also in your purview, like you're going to cultivate certain habits and you're going to do so intentionally or unintentionally. You're going to do so faithfully or unfaithfully. And this is a hard thing sometimes for us to realize is that like, no, we have this responsibility as the sort of cultural guardians to shape the rhythms of our home, both by rules and by customs, by, by habits. Um, so I'm saying to a dad, I'm saying, hey, you, you need to give some thought to these uh, and to think about your, your rhythms uh, in your life and, the, and the, the communities that then your household then syncs up with. So if worship's pumping blood, it goes to the household. From the household, then you're going to sync up with other households. And that might be through church. It could be through school. Uh, your kid's school. It could be through your workplace, right? You might work with some guys and like you guys, your families do a lot of things together in common enterprise. Um, it could be through sports or other other sorts of things like that. But there's going to be these other um, wider, broader entities that your household is going to connect to. And you're bringing your, um, your culture and customs into that in order to shape a broader culture and custom in this larger community now. And again, worship ought to be fueling all of it. And so we're in, in a Christian school, the worship in the church is going to spill over into the Christian school. If if you're playing on a sports team and it's a bunch of non-Christians and you, then you're trying to bring an evangelistic culture into that, right? You're looking for opportunities to model what Christ looked, uh, you know, the beauty of Christ to unbelievers. But you're trying, again, you're trying to influence through your own habits and practice and behavior and words. Um, what what God is like, and then testify to the gospel. Mm-hmm. So your household. So from the from the church heartbeat, 
pumps blood to your family. And then your family as a household is then trying to sync up with other uh, communities, other, other households. They may not even think of themselves as households, but they, they are right. Those, that family on the football team is a household that you're then combining together for this purpose uh, and trying to create a great environment for your kids to play sports. Right. Okay. No, that's, that's good. And the whole, the whole heartbeat, I, I, I was trying to just listen to what you were saying, cause it was so good. But then I was sitting there thinking back to you talking about the three household rules of, you know, obey, obey the rules of this house. You don't lie and you don't disrespect your mother. And now I'm trying to rack my brain with where I stole that from. Cause I've told my kids that for years <laughs> yeah. and now it's uh, very apparent it that I stole it from someone. <laughs> no, yeah. We, we both stole it from Doug probably. The, uh, there you go. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, um, and, and, and so then I think, uh, from there, you know, you can think about, um, what the, the logistics then become a really important question of like the practicals here. And so, uh, one of the things to think about is your use of time and your use of your space, like the, the various kind of space in terms of like, um, where you live, that kind of thing. Okay. So yeah. in terms of, in terms of time, you've got, you got, you got to structure your days, you got to structure your weeks, your months, your years, your seasons of life. Um, and so you're going to take all of that into account to, to steward your time in a way that's that's faithful. And then you're going to think about the different sphere. We, you, the, here's where I do think thinking about overlapping spheres is helpful. So almost all of us um, in the in the modern America are going to have a sphere of like our vocation, our job. You're going to have a sphere of school, assuming you have children. You're going to have your church the congregation you're a part of, you'll probably have some kind of social, you know, extracurricular. That's probably like the sports team, or if you, if you keep your girls are in dance or gymnastics or whatever that sort of stuff is, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're in drama, that kind of thing. And then your neighborhood, like where your actual, your home is, where you live. And those are, those are those, each of those spaces is there's the possibility of community and culture building. Um, and when you, when you, Put those together. How do you regulate your time and how do you regulate the space? You see how important stewardship is because you can't do it all. Right. And there's going to be there's going to be limitations. And so that means what? Well, now you're going to have to establish priorities. What are the things that are most important? What's next and next and next? And you've got to um, and so and and different. And this is where the seasons comes into play. Like if you're unmarried, priority is like go find a wife, right? Find a spouse. That if you're unmarried that rises in importance in terms of your use of stewardship of time. If, um, if you have kids, I think about this a lot. I have school age kids. I got a, a 14 year old, a 12 year old, a five year old. Well, this season of life, I say no to lots of stuff because I have a priority of discipling my kids. Right. You know, so, you know, as a, as a, here's, here's a practical example, like I get invited to come speak at places pretty regularly. And I've learned over the years that there are certain, uh, oh, uh, times of year, I don't want to be gone because it's baseball season or football season, because I want to be present. My kid, there's a window of time in which my sons are uh, playing in little league or playing high school football. And I want to be there for every bit of it, you know, in, in 10 years, that season's over. And now I can say yes to more travel because I'm not, because I'm an empty nester maybe at that point or something, you know? Um, and so I'm, but, but my season of life is determining certain priorities for me that stewards my time and where I am, my location uh, wisely. And so when I, when I think about how do you do it, you need to have that list of what, what are, what, you know, days, weeks, months, years, and spheres, and then season of life and pull those together to go, how do we steward this well? Mm-hmm. So you're, you're already starting to walk into some of what I wanted to get into, which is like the obstacles to doing this whole thing. Yeah. Um, you're already mentioning a few of them, um, obviously time management. And I think a lot of, especially dads, you know, I'm, I'm right there with you. My oldest is 14 um, and I'm already looking back and, you know, evaluating like, am I, have I used my time wisely? Mm -hmm. Probably not at times want to do that better going forward, that sort of thing. But, but just in general, and I wonder too, you know, speaking to the obstacles, I wonder if it changes things that, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the, you know, Aaron Wren's negative world conception, a lot of the um, the mm -hmm. ways our culture is going. There's there's kind of those macro level obstacles, but you're also addressing some of the practical level obstacles that are just always there. But in your opinion, what are what are some right. of those major obstacles Christians are hitting right now to to doing what you're describing? Yeah, so I would say um, I'm going to actually give kind of three surprising ones because they're all technological. Um, so I think three, th three unrecognized obstacles to thick community mm -hmm. are the car, the internet, and the smartphone. Wow. 
And you say, oh, wow, those those are all, aren't those great? Like we can get across the country, we can take our vacation and go across the country and see grandma. And, and the internet is how we're able to have this conversation right now. And the smartphone is how we keep in touch. And it's like, yeah, they're, in, they're tremendous blessings. And I'm not saying that, but they also have the, there's, there's cost, there's trade-offs. So the effect of the car on our notion of place and the, the way that it stretches us thin in terms of both our time and where we are. So, because it, it alters your notion of community. So like 150 years ago, when people said, hey, who's your community? That's basically like, well, walk outside your house and yell as loud as you can. Anybody that can hear you is your community, right? right? That's right. how far can you, how far can you walk in 45 minutes? That's your community, okay? Um, and what that, what, what that, that was a limitation, a technological limitation and but what it enabled was a, a tremendous amount of overlap between the different spheres, right? Your home, where you lived, where you worked, where your kids went to school, where you went to church, were all sort of restrained and restricted by the lack of mobility, right? Mm. Well, that, that, what, that, what that meant is there's lots of overlap. It, they, they, those communities were really dense because the, the people you work with and the people you go to church with and who your kids go to school with and who they play baseball with and all that is going to be the same group. Well, now you add the car to it. And you're driving 30 minutes in one direction to go to work. You drive 30 minutes in another direction to take the kids to school. You go 30 minutes in another direction to make sure that they can play for that sports team. And now all of a sudden, your notions of space and, and you're stretched thin because you're spending hours in the car. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, okay, is that what you, is that what you want? And, and you wonder, why doesn't it feel like everything's hanging together? Well, now those different groups, they're, they're different. There's, instead of one community that you sort of encounter in different modes, so we see that we see that family at church. We see that family in, at school. We see that family at work. Um, instead of encountering that same people in different aspects, it's four different groups of people, right. often sometimes autonomous. Like you never see them at all. This is, I think, especially true for people who live in like uh, urban or suburban environments. It's a little bit different in smaller towns. This has been a, a, a realization, you know, sort of in moving from. I was in Minneapolis for eighteen years, uh, and now I'm in Moscow. Um, so a city of a couple million to a city of 25,000. And, um, and this is, a, this is probably one of the most significant differences between those two experiences is here. I don't have to choose that there's certain just things that are given. Like I, it just, it just is the case that Logos is the school my kids go to. Most of the families go to Christ church or King's cross or Trinity. Uh, the, the, the overlap where you can drive from one end of town to the other in 10 minutes the overlap of everything is just a given. I don't have to choose it. It's just reality. Right. Well, in Minneapolis, to have that same experience required me to make decisions. And it's easy sometimes to let decisions be made sort of for you without a lot of thought so that you end up uh, driving 30 minutes in different directions multiple times a week in order to, to function. And you feel worn out and spent and you don't know why because you're like, hey, I'm just all, what am I doing? I'm going to church and I'm going to work and I'm going to school. Why does it feel like we're stretched so thin? And it's like, well, because those are three different communities in three different parts of a city and you've sort of chosen to have them be decondensed, fragmented. And so you feel fragmented. So I think those are the sort of things that like often are unrecognized uh, with families in terms of building community and the, the basic principle. And so that that's car. You could say the same thing about the internet. Um, it, it fosters connection and community, but it also can lead to kind of like um, self-selection where you just end up in an echo chamber and therefore you can't function with people who aren't exactly like you. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, so the online echo chambers where nobody can even talk to each other because they forgot how, because they're so used to the group think. And then the smartphone, obviously, um, it just can be a major distraction. Everybody, everybody knows this about the way that it can pull you out of present active community life and you can spend all your time, you can doom scroll, you can you know, envy scroll. And so you're spending your, your, your energy that could be devoted to culture making, culture building, community building, where you actually are present is instead wasted and spent, uh, you know, scrolling online. And so those three things are often unrecognized, um, what, what do you call them? Like uh, community sucks, right? They just, right. they suck the life out of a community because you're fragmented by the car you're isolated by your internet because you're you're group thinking it and your and your cell phone's distracting you.
Yeah, no, that's that's super. Because I'm I'm thinking, you know, you're talking mainly. I mean, mainly you're addressing kind of like family dynamics there, but it applies right. to the church level too, right? Like we, uh, For sure. you know, they've they've talked about like the commuter church model. You've got the you know the mega yep. church on the outskirts, and everybody commutes in from at least thirty minutes. But even I would say like. Yep. Half the pastors I talk to, the church will be 100, 150 people, a small church, right? And yet you've got like eight school districts that are represented. Everybody's kind of yep. scattered, even in small. And then you then you have this disconnected feeling, which I feel like is so pervasive mm-hmm. in our society right now. Everybody, including Christians, feels so disconnected yep. from things. Um, yeah, that, that that really explains things. So you're, you're suggesting instead to not only be aware of those obstacles, but obviously to try to mitigate those when possible um, and kind of right. build so that, that sense of... Yep. Yeah, yeah. The basic principle is something like aim to maximize the overlap of your spheres. There you go. Like okay. if you if you just take if you take it if you take a principle, it's in terms of setting priorities, given limitations of time and limit and the fact that you're a human being who has a body and you can only be in one place at one at one time. Um, trying to over maximize the overlap of spheres. Very few few of us can do it completely, and I don't even know if that it would be fully desirable if you had complete overlap of all spheres, um, because it'd probably be insular. Mm. Um, but to the degree that you can have overlap between the people you go to church with, the people you, your kids go to school with, where you live and who you work with. Um, that's, that's a really good thing. And I'd say it's like right now when I, when I do sort of self eval my own life, um, we go to school, uh, our, our kids go to school with people we go to church with. We're in a small town. So the neighborhood kind of takes care of itself. Um, I work with a lot of the folks, you know, I work here at NSA, I work at the, at the church. Um, and so there's overlap there. Um, the one place that's kind of the wild card that's sort of its its own thing is um, my boys play baseball for just a, like the the school doesn't have a baseball team and we were a big baseball family. So my son's playing baseball at the public high school and my oldest son is and my middle son is playing for a, a travel team in Pullman. And so those are the two places where we're kind of like outside of our normal uh, our normal community. And we think that's good. Like it's opportunity. You know, we're on we're around non-Christians um through that and there's opportunities there. So that's that so but but that that's something, you know, because we live in a small town, a lot of that is just given. Whereas I think that what people don't realize living in an urban environment or a suburban environment is you're gonna have to make intentional choices in order to maximize that overlap. You're gonna have to decide, okay, I want to live here because that's close to and then and then maybe here's I'll add this to this. Um Oftentimes we we miss. So I said earlier that the church is the heartbeat of the community, and that's true. And spiritually, that's that's the most important. It's the pumps the blood. As a practical matter, logistically, the center of your life, if you're a, if you're a parent, if you have children, the center of your life for that season is your school. So it's actually, in terms of the logistics, it's more important to live. I think closer to the school. Than it is to live closer to your church. Interesting. Okay. No, I see what because, you're getting at. Be, because because you know it's one thing you know, so you drive in thirty minutes to go to church on Sunday. Okay, that's not a great. That's a that's a long drive. Um, but that's but would you rather drive once a week thirty minutes on a Sunday morning and then a Sunday afternoon to get to church and back, versus every day driving thirty to forty five minutes to get the kids to school to take them and then to pick them up and to take right. them and to pick them up. Well, now you're talking about you know, 10 hours, 11 hours, 12 hours more a week, getting the kids back and forth. And, and, and great. You live next door to the church, which there okay, you can, it takes five minutes to get, to get to the church on Sunday. So as a practical matter, like in terms of, of stewarding the time that you have, um, I think living close to your school, because the school will often for that season of life, when you have school age children will be the central hub of your sort of social life. It's the, it's the most common orienting thing. Cause it's the kids, you gotta get the kids there for school. And then usually after school activities, sports and other extracurriculars are oriented by that as well. So that um, maximizing that overlap between your, where you live and where your kids go to school, I think is actually, I would put that as a higher priority, even if that means you're driving farther to go to the church that you want to go to, because that's where the words preach. And that's the culture that you want to cultivate in your home. Okay. So, I mean, with that in mind, I mean, because we've been talking about Christian communities, but but I'm kind of thinking, and I don't want to get too far afield, but just like the cultural impact of that, because um, mm-hmm. you're bringing up schools, like it, it I, this this seems like it would be uh, it would be an easy way to suggest Christian education as a viable option 
Um, if there's not Christian education near you, maybe start investing in that. I mean, that's, that's one of the things Moscow right. has been famous for, right? Is like the, right. the Christian education, um, especially classical Christian education. Would you see that as kind of part of this dynamic? Hundred percent. So yeah, I should have probably said that more explicitly. So if if uh, if if you're thinking of a body and worship is the heartbeat, corporate worship, church is the heart. There, corporate worship is the heartbeat. Um, I would say education is like the skeleton. Okay. Um, it's like it's the backbone. It's the thing that gives structure to it. So that's where. Um, when the Bible says, you know, uh, parents bring your children up, uh, fathers bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, but the paideia of the Lord, this is an enculturation process, um, of both law and custom, um, of instruction to the mind and shaping of the heart. It's a, it's a, it's the total immersion in a culture. That's what parents are charged to do for their kids. Well, you can do that. You can homeschool your kids and do that. Um, at one time, you might have been able to do it in a public school, but right now, if you were to have your kids in public school, you're effectively saying, "Well, I'm going to have my, I'm going to have the state and and the, and the godless, hostile state educate my kids, and then I'm going to try to de-educate them when they come home." So sure. you're just doing the job's getting done twice. It's just enculturate, de-enculturate is what you're choosing choosing to do there. And I know some people are stuck at the options they have. Sure. Um, I just think they ought to be trying to prioritize. Yes, um, find it, find a way to give your kids a Christian education. That's that's what that's what they need. Um, and so if that means moving closer to the school, uh, if it means homeschooling, whatever, whatever that means. So, and it, with homeschooling, uh, it changes the dynamics since you're doing school, school at home, but often, you know, at least today, homeschoolers are doing a lot of co-ops, a lot of collaborative things where multiple homeschool families. And so then it's move closer to those families so that there's again, significant overlap in your spheres. The other, the other thing I'd say about this is to the degree that it's possible, um, beginning to see, you know, this is one of the, um, Elements. Uh, Chris Wiley uh, has written a number of really good things on this about the recovering the productive household. Yep. Where you 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 trying to reorient your view of the household away from the household. The, the home is where we come to kind of detox. It's a place of consumption where we come home to watch TV and veg out, and instead viewing it as a place of production where the household itself is engaged in some kind of common enterprise. Um, and potentially linking up with other households in common enterprise. So going into business together or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so there's a way which, especially for men, I think this is an important, important thing. Um, it's energizing to partner with like-minded uh, brothers in order to do some common enterprise, whatever the business is, it can, construction business, or, um, and, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a lawyer going into law, you know, have, start a firm or, or wh whatever, whatever your sphere, a plumbing company, whatever it is, like common vocation with other folks who are like-minded is both energizing and is a, is a part of like community building. That's right. Um, and it's especially important, I think, as we enter, you mentioned negative world a little bit ago, um, Aaron Wren's notion there, and I've said probably for the last 10 years, even before this was, a, even before the, the negative world really manifested itself, that uh, in the present day and for the foreseeable future, one of the most loving things that you can do for your Christian brother is to provide a work environment where he can pull a paycheck and not have to lie. Wow. Yeah. Right. Like in other words, so he can live in the truth and doesn't have to doesn't have the constant specter of, okay, if they ask me to fly the rainbow flag, am I going to quit? Right. I feel like I have to quit, but then how am I going to provide for my family? Like that anxiety and that angst that hangs over a lot of guys because they're in an environment that's hostile to their faith. And they're always trying to thread all the needles lest they set off the, um, the, the Wokies and the rainbow brigade. Um, if so, so what would be an act of love to that guy? Well, having a, having a business, having a company, where that guy can work and he can just be a faithful Christian. It doesn't mean that only Christians work there, but it means that the norms and the structures and the, the, um, the values of the company are Christian. And so that he's, he's welcome to be there. You can have a non-Christian work there. He can evangelize them. That's great. But, but the point is he can, he can be himself. He can be a faithful Christian and not have to worry about providing for his family. Yep. Um, that's an act of love. And so entrepreneurship in the present environment um, common enterprise. And again, that's, a, that's, what does that create? That's a possibility of overlapping spheres. If, so again, if you're, if you start a business and you've got a couple of guys whose kids go to the same school and you guys are a part of the same church that provides multiple touch points where you're going to be around people that allows for a thickness of community that I think all of us are craving and finding very difficult 
in the modern technological fragmented world. Yeah, no, that's that's super helpful. And the, the business thing, I think, is so if anybody's ever seen and been around that sort of environment where you have just a Christian employer, again, like you said, you're not signing a statement of faith when you join the job, but everybody knows what the business is and everybody knows what the values are. Just that sense yep. of that sense of peace that that can bring. We have, yep. um, you know, I pastor a smallish church and it, it's almost a weekly conversation with somebody about their employer and something coming down the pike that they're going to have to, yep. to wrestle with uh, morally. Um, any, any thoughts, uh, Dr. Rigney, on anything we've covered, any, any kind of like you know, closing, uh, maybe even resources to point somebody to or um, something like that yeah. concerning Christian communities? Yeah, I think the other thing uh, that, I'll, that I'll have is a number of things that I'm talking about here. Uh, you know, I'll be out in um, in Utah with the Ogden guys in June. You know, they got a conference on um, building Christian boroughs or something right. like that. Yep. So it's a similar kind of deal. So some of what I'm saying here is kind of like the the rough the rough cut of what will be there. So if you're interested and you want to come out and, to that conference in uh, in June, uh, you'll get a little bit more. Uh, I think the, the only other thing maybe at this point that I'd say is um, is recognizing the importance of stability. This is, again, where that mobility question is a kind of disruptor. Uh, the ease with which we can move, move houses, move neighborhoods, move cities. Um, I mean, I just I just made a big move about eight months ago. And I'm I'm thinking about this because uh, you know it, it uprooted our family. We moved him across the country, uh, and and it was I think faithful. It was it was, the, it was the right decision, all things considered. But um, a highly mobile society sort of militates against the cultivation of customs and tradition. Yep. And those are actually really important. We crave them. We want them, and they're harder to to maintain and sustain if if you got people who are constantly coming and going. Now, there's no way I don't I don't think we can un put that genie back in the bottle. That's just part of the world we live in. But to the degree that we can uh, try to have a kind of uh, stability, you plant roots and you try to really say, this is our, this is where we are. And we want to grow. Uh, we want to build here. Uh, that I think enables the, the, um, a shared life, a shared way of life. Um, we feel like I, I don't have a way of life. It's just kind of all deracinated, um, decontextualized. Um, it's modern, modern pop culture, rootless, rootlessness. And instead, what I think a lot of people want is something sturdier, deeper that has that has deep roots where you, where you build something that you can hand on to your kids and then they can hand on to their grandkids, uh, to your grandkids and generational uh, generationally. And uh, customs and traditions like that require stable communities. Mm hmm. Um, and the other thing, the other thing maybe to say about that kind of idea of custom is um, you want, this is, I think, why in the present moment, a lot of times, um, you know, I'd, I'd say probably, you know, 20 years ago when I was in, when I was in college, the question of like picking a church often centered first about kind of doctrine, at least that's how, you know, so I think some people were like, oh, did that, do they like the kids program or something? I was in college, so I didn't care about that. But uh it was like, you know, theologically, where are they? What's their statement of faith? And I think now a lot of what people are actually looking for more is, is this the kind of community that's going to reinforce our, the kind of culture that we want in our home? Because we feel the hostility of negative world around us and know that like, we can't, like, I want to guard my family, but there's just so many entry points that the world has in terms of media and technology and and just the toxicity of the of of the world, and it's like I want to be able to have my kids in a place where other families are going to reinforce the values, customs, and practices, habits that I want to instill in my kids. Right. And so, in some ways, um, shared culture and and cultural affinity is an even I think stronger draw for people, and that that enables them to overlook even theological differences that twenty years ago might have really mattered. So this I'm thinking about. People who, if if they have, if there's a shared culture there, we can get past the baptism, pedo baptism thing. We can get past eschatology thing. We can get mm -hmm. past um, the spiritual, you know, uh, gifts of the spirit sort of discussions. We might even be able to get it past some of the sovereignty of God, Calvinism, Arminianism stuff. Um, those things, in some ways, I can I can tolerate a lot of uh, differences at those levels if there's a really thick shared community of. That I can that I'm trying to raise my kids in, and I think that's probably wise and good mm. um, to to prioritize that. That's not to, that's not to deprioritize some of those important theological questions, but it's to say that in an environment where you want to raise your kids to love Christ, um, you can if if 
it's much harder if everybody agrees on paper that God is sovereign in salvation, but you've got uh, one family that has a lot of worldliness coming in because they're in the public school, another family that has a very weird view of how to discipline kids. And you've got a bunch of fragmentation in terms of how you actually build culture. That's actually a harder environment to navigate uh, than it is someone who we all, we're all synced up on raising our kids, Christian education. Uh, but we do have some differences on these theological secondary matters. Right. Um, I think, I think that that makes sense in negative world. Right. No, that's that, 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 that seems to be panning out. And I think that's one reason why you see a lot of churches seemingly, uh, making some pointed efforts toward mitigating some of those theological distinctions. Again, not to like, not to say that they're not important and not to grapple with those things and yet not to make those dividing lines that divide Christian communities up. Um, no, super helpful. Appreciate you joining me today. Everybody go out and buy yeah. Leadership and Emotional Sabotage, although we didn't talk much about the book on here, but it's a great book. But uh, Dr. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Seated here at my right hand.